if you, you're with us and you know we got revival nights coming up, August uh, 13th through 16th. It's Sunday, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Sunday night at 6, Wednesday at 7. And uh, I think they'll just be a great time of refreshing and right before school kind of kicks back off, getting, getting just focused on God. And then right, right now, we got a group of kids on a missions trip in Pittsburgh. My youngest son is with them and we get texts from him every now and then. He's having a great time and they're doing some great work. They're doing VBSs and, and uh, doing all kind of all fun stuff. So let's keep them in prayer. And then RFK starts next week. It's a, a camp for foster and adoptive kids. There's about 50 of us adults that will be going to minister to these, these, these kids. And I just, again, pray with us. It's going to be a, a great time. And then small group sign up is on Sunday. So if you're not in a small group, get in one. Well, we're, in a, we're in a series, and we'll talk more about that on Sunday. But we're in this series on Days of Elijah, and we've just been taking a few weeks to work through it. This is week Number four, and if I can just catch you up, if you want to turn in your Bible, you can turn to 1 Kings 17. But Israel is God's chosen people, remember, and, and he had a plan and a purpose for them. And he called them not because they were good, but because he was good. Not because they were necessarily special, but because, because he's special. And not anything to do with their merit but his mercy. And he wanted to partner with a group of people that would declare to the rest of the world that relationship so that really the ultimate goal is that everybody would follow Jehovah God. Well, Israel, they, they were up and down, in and out, and, and they wanted a king. It came a time in their history where they were led by judges and prophets and and uh, they wanted a king. And God said, I don't want you to have a king. I want to be your king. And they said, well, just give us a king. So I'm, sometimes God gives you what you want even when it's not the best thing for you. You keep you keep going after him and keep whatever. And then I think he gives it to you so you find out that's really what, not what I needed nor wanted. I should have just listened and done what he told me to do in the first place. Anybody ever been down that road? And, and, so, and so Israel, he gave him a king and David was a good, Saul was a bad king. David was a good king. The third king was Solomon and he began to lead their hearts away from God. He started intermarrying these foreign wives, a bunch of them, and they started bringing these false gods in, Baal, Asherah, Molech, all kind of false gods and, and false worship. So, so 19 kings later, Ahab comes on the scene and now it's progressively gotten worse and worse and worse. And now false worship is everywhere. Jehovah God is just a memory. They're sacrificing kids. They're worshiping sex. It's a terrible, terrible place. And uh, we've last few weeks, we've talked about uh, Ahab and Elijah. And tonight, I, I want to talk about, I mean, we've talked about Ahab and Jezebel. And tonight, I want to talk a little bit about Elijah. But finally, God says, enough is enough. Like, I've had enough. 200 years of apostasy, 200 years of walking away from me. Somebody asked me, do you think God is tolerant? I don't think God is tolerant. I think God is patient. I think he's extremely patient. And uh, he's revealed that to us in the Bible, to Israel. But I don't think he's tolerant, meaning that sin is eventually gonna be found out. And sin is eventually gonna have to be dealt with, either privately or publicly. And uh, and you know, I, 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 I'm, I really think we ought to, I think our, God, the Bible is not just what God did, it's what God does. And so if you look at the Bible, you look at patterns and things, and I'm a little concerned, I, we ought to be a lot concerned for America, because I really don't, I think if the people of God don't rally and get bold and get on their knees in prayer and, and really walk in, a, in, a, in an anointing during this season, I, I, I had, Angie and I had a chance last night to go to Sound of Freedom, and uh, you know, it's just, it's about sex slavery, and the industry, and they said the, the, America is the number one uh, people coming and consumer of sex trafficking, and 50% of the victims are children. And I don't think God, I, I don't think God is gonna put up with that. I mean, he's patient, but he's not tolerant. And if we don't come to a place where things start changing, I'm, I'm worried for my nation. I do, I do believe that God, he sent revival, he sent fire, and I'm getting off, but he, sent, he sent, sent fire to Israel, and I believe in God to send fire to America. But anyway, here we go. So let's talk about Elijah in 1 Kings 17. Now Elijah, and he kind of comes out of nowhere. He kind of comes out of a place where uh, nobody even really knows him. His, his name means, uh, I, his, let me tell you what his name means, and I need to look at it so I get it right. The Lord is my God or my God is Jehovah. And so he, all we know about Elijah is he's a Tishbite, he's from Tishbe, 
in Gilead. Uh, the New Testament says that he, he wore camel skin, so he's a hairy dude. He's kind of like Chewbacca, I guess, big, hairy guy. And, and he comes on the scene, and he says, as the Lord, the God of Israel. But I, I just want you to know, God, what, the Lord wasn't the God of Israel during this time. They'd rejected him. They'd forfeited him. They'd walked away from him. But, but Elijah's bringing up the past. Hey, guys, you remember this covenant God made with Israel and whom I serve? There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So Chewbacca comes on the scene. Nobody really knows him. Big hairy dude. And he says, there's not going to be any rain or any dew for three years. And I'm sure they're laughing at him. Who is this nut job? Why would he even say that? But listen, if there's no rain, there's no grain. If there's no grain, there's no food. And if there's no food, there's no life. So they're an agriculture uh, Consume. So it's all about what the ground produces. It would kind of be like in our world, you can't get gas at Wawa, you, you can't get your money out the bank, no electricity at home. Life as you knew it, with no rain for three years, it just ended. Unemployment would reach epic proportions. People will be starving. It'd be another great uh, depression. And so again, I don't think God is tolerant, but I do think he's patient. But enough is enough, Israel, and, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have to deal with what you're doing. So courageous I, 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 uh, Elijah, spirit-filled Elijah, prophesied no rain. In verse 18, he's going to have an encounter with Ahab, and he's going to conquer the prophets of Baal. We'll talk about that on Sunday, and it's going to be an incredible time. But before he does that, we got to go to chapter 17, which we're going to study tonight. So no, no rain. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He just gave this prophetic word. They're probably thinking, who are you? What are you saying? What are you even talking about? And immediately the Lord came to him and said, hey, Elijah, Chewbacca, I want you to leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan River. The Kareth means cut off or cut down. It means like you would chop down a tree. So uh, the, the application here is God is sending him, I'm going to take you through a season of breaking. First Kings 18 is coming. Like you're gonna face Ahab and you're gonna call fire down from heaven and, 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 and you're gonna kill all the prophets of Baal and it's gonna be an amazing day and everybody's gonna know that I'm Jehovah God. But before I do that, I gotta do something in you. Before we get to 18, we have to have 17. It's a season of preparation. I'm gonna humble you privately so I can use you publicly. And, and some of us, uh, we don't like this. We don't like these seasons of preparation. But I'm telling you, if you do anything for God, and really, in any, you're going to go through a season of preparation. And, and I think all of us, we ought to have a passion and want to do something for God. Now, everybody's not going to call fire down from heaven, and not everybody, we can't do everything, but we ought to want to do something. Like, we ought to want to use our spiritual gift and our passion and our abilities and, and our experience and our personality. We ought to yield that to God and say, God, I want you to use me. I want you to use me to make a difference in my world. I might not be able to change the world, but I can change my world with your help and with your strength. And I think if we're not living with that kind of mentality, we're missing out on a lot of what God wants to do for us. Like your job is not just a job. Your job is a mission field. Your neighborhood is not just somewhere you live. You're, you know the Bible says that Jesus moved into the neighborhood in, in uh, John chapter 1 in the message version. We're put, we're put strategically in places to make a difference and we ought to be asking the Lord consistently, God how do you want to use me and what do you want to do through me? And Elijah got to that point and, th and there was a season of preparation just like David you know, David was told he was going to be king, and he didn't become king for 13 years. 13 years of preparation, 13 years of getting to know God, 13 years of tending sheep, 13 years of running from Saul, 13 years of sleeping under the stars. And, and in those times, he didn't just, he didn't just, I mean, he was getting to know God. He was writing songs. He was writing in his journal. He was, he was falling more and more in love with God and discerning his will. It wasn't a wasted season. It was a preparing season. If you look at Moses, I mean, God called him to deliver the children of Israel, and it took 40 years. For 40 years, he, he was in the desert waiting, and, but he was growing. He was maturing. He was in that carrot, that valley of carrot, where he was cut off or, or cut down. He was in a season of preparation where God was preparing him uh, uh, for something. And, you know, we don't like that. So at least I don't. I, I'm not very patient. I don't like waiting in traffic. I don't like waiting on the phone. You ever called... Like I called Verizon not long ago. Uh, you'd be, you've called them? You know what I'm talking about. 
And, and they, I said, I'm having trouble with my phone. And so they put me on hold. And then I'm on hold for another few minutes. And then they connect me to somebody. And then they say, hey, we can package you and we can give you Fios. This is what they were saying. And if you'll put your phone with Fios, we can save you money. I don't want to save money. I just want my phone to work. Well, let me transfer you to somebody else. And, and then they said, the next person said, well, if you, if you, get, if you get this, this uh this Fios package, we'll give you HBO and Cinemax. I don't want HBO, I don't want Cinemax, I just want my phone to work. Please help my phone to work. An hour and nine minutes later. No, I hung up. Phone still didn't work. It's, it's so, ag if you work for Verizon, I'm sorry, I'm sure you had nothing to do with that, but, but, but I just hate it, I hate waiting. And we don't like waiting in the preparation season. We want it instantaneously. We want it, we want it right now, don't we? But, but don't wait. Don't wait without a purpose. God's doing something in that season. I, I even remember when we were, uh, when the kids were younger, we would go on vacation and, and they would, you know how they are. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. Just enjoy the ride. We're getting there. It's going to be great when we get there. And I think sometimes we're like that with God. And, 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 and we act kind of childish. God, are you there yet? You said it wouldn't be this long. Are we there yet? Are we? I think the spirit of slap just wants to come over God. And I think he just wants to knock us upside the head and say, just be patient. Just wait. I'm working in you. I'm working through you. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the ride. I, trust in me. You know, I was... Are y'all Karate Kid? Anybody remember Karate Kid? As I was preparing for this sermon, I was thinking about this. Yeah. And he goes to Mr. Miyagi, that guy, the little fellow that was on Happy Days. If you got to be old to remember Happy Days. But he was on Happy Days first. And then he went to Karate Kid. And he went to him and he said, I want to learn how to fight. And, 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 and reluctantly, Mr. Miyagi said, okay. And he got there the next day. And what did he do? He said, paint the house. Paint the house, Daniel son. Paint the house, Daniel son. And, and so he went out there and he painted the house and he was just kind of sliding. No, 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 Daniel, son. No, 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 no. Up and down. Si up and down. Side to side. And so for the whole day, Daniel, son. You remember this? And then wash the, wax the car. Wax, wax up. No, 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 Daniel, son. Wax on, wax out. You, you know the story. And then what happened after three days, Daniel, son, is ticked, man. He's like, I, 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 I'm supposed to learn how to fight. You're making me your slave. What are you talking about? And then Miyagi gets in front of him and says, okay, you want to fight? And he goes, ah! And Daniel, son, goes, pew, pew, pew. And all the wax in it. All the, I'm, the story's better than I'm communicating it. But, <laughs> but, I mean, now he's got it all together. And then Daniel, son, steps back and goes, oh, that's what was going on. That's what was happening. I didn't realize it. I didn't know it. But now I see it. And now I'm, now I'm walking in it. Now I'm enjoying it. And, and I just want you to, when you're going through a season of preparation or a difficult time, don't let it get so close to your face that you can't push back a little bit and recognize and know that God's in control and that God's working. It, here's what the Bible says. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So uh, Elijah was in that season of prayer. Well, what was, he, what, was he, and what was he learning? I'll come back and share that. What was he learning? I think God was teaching him a couple things. The first thing, he was teaching him total dependence. That God, God is, Elijah, God has to be your source. Listen, so he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to Carith Ravine, east of the Jordan. He stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the book, brook. So God, super, in a famine, God supernaturally provided for him with a raven and naturally provided with him for a brook. But I think the whole point of this is, God, Elijah, I want you to learn that I'm your source. Your job's not your source. Your bank account's not your source. Your employer's not your source. God is your source. And everything and everybody else is just a resource. It's a, mechanic, it's a, it's a mechanism God uses to meet your need. You know, God used a raven you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, the Bible says don't mess with ravens because they're unclean. But in Elijah's case, we have a God using an unclean bird to, to provide for a faithful man. You know what the point is? God can use hell to bring heaven to you. God, God does not sin or cause us to sin, but he can use sinners to provide for his people. He, uh, there's a story I heard, I think friend, uh, Jensen Franklin preached it and was talking about it. And there was this lady whose pantry was running dry, but she constantly just sang, great is thy faithfulness. And she'd walk around the house and the, the little complex 
drugs she was living in, the walls were paper thin, and there was an atheist beside her, and he just heard her all the time, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see, and she was just rejoicing, she didn't have anything, and, and he would hear her praying, God, will you provide? And he told her one day, he said, would you quit praying to that God? There's no God, he's not gonna provide for you. You can't, on the third day, he said, I'll show her, I'll go get her groceries. And so he went and got her groceries and he put it on her doorsteps. He knocked on the door and then he jumped in the bushes. And she came to the door and she saw the groceries and she got so excited. God has provided. I knew his faithfulness was great. His mercies are new. This is amazing. And he jumped out of the bush and he said, God didn't provide those. I provided those. And I told you there was no God and I told you he wouldn't provide. And she looked at him and said, God, only, God not only provided, but he used the devil to deliver it. God can use, God can provide however. And I think God is teaching Elijah, hey, depend on me. Let, let me be your source. And I don't know about you, but I struggle with that at times. Like I think I gotta get past God and I gotta be God and I, and I gotta make sure my, everything's in order. And I'm not saying don't save, I'm not saying that I'm all. But ultimately God is our source. And then here's the other thing. Uncon I think he was teaching him unconditional obedience. And remember, he's about to go to chapter 18. He's about to face the devil. He's about to, 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 to interact with 850 prophets of Baal. He can't just be an any old somebody. He's got to be ready. He's got to be prepped. He needed to know total dependence because he needed to know that, that, that when he called fire down from heaven, God was going to respond. He fed him with ravens and he brought, gave him water out of the brook. If he did that, God could send fire from heaven. And he had to be in a place where he was totally obedient. Listen to what the Bible says. Uh, but after a while, the brook dried up for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. So what was hurting the country was now hurting him. And it says, then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have dedicated, a, I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. A widow is a famine. The widow was the least of the least. Why would I go there, God? Listen to what happened the very next verse. So he went. To Zarephath, he, he, he obeyed. I mean, it didn't make sense. And when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks and he called her and asked, would you bring me a little water and a jar so I may have a drink? People that do things for God have learned to unconditionally obey God. L listen to what the word says. How can you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say? Obedience is a big deal. Like, Dwayne, it matters if you obey or not. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. If, and, and here's the, make sure we got the calm in the right place. If you love me, you're, you're gonna keep, not if you keep my commands, then you love me. No, if you really love God, look where the calm is and look how it's spelled out. If you really love me, the result of that will be you'll wanna keep my commands. If you trust me and you're, and, and you're following me and, and you're dependent on me and you have a walk with me, then there's naturally gonna be a byproduct that you'll want to keep my commands. We know if we come to know him, if we come to church, well, that's one of his commands, forsake not the gathering of yourselves. But, if we, but if, we, if we obey his commands, the man who says I know him but does not do what he has commanded is a liar and the truth is not in him. Listen, let me give you one more. Do not merely listen to the word James says so you deceive yourself, but do what it says. You know, I, I, I'm, if, if there wasn't a chapter 17, there would have never been a chapter 18 in 1 Kings. You, you look at Abraham. Can I just give you some examples? God told Abraham, hey, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. That's crazy to Abraham. What do you mean? What, I, I don't ever, it didn't make sense to him. It did, but you know what the Bible says? The very next morning, he packed up all his stuff and he headed to the mountain to sacrifice his son. And it was just a test when he was coming down out of that mountain, God provided. But he said, now I know that you fear God. If Abraham wouldn't have obeyed, there'd been no nation. I look at Noah and God said, Noah, build an ark. And Noah said, what, build an ark? It's never rained before then. There was no large body of water. And this ark was massive. It, was, it would be like this. Hey, 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 Stan, build a ganook, it's gonna jamp. You say, what does that mean? I don't know what it means. Ne neither did Noah. Build an ark, it's gonna rain. Build a ganook, it's gonna jamp. Who knows what that means? It makes no sense. But he said, nevertheless, Lord, at your word, I'll obey you. And for 100 years, he built that boat. 
as people mocked him and laughed at him and made fun of him. And, he, and, the, and the boat preserved his family. Out of obedience, it preserved I mean, we could go on and on with Peter. Just got done fishing. He had all his nets lined up. He was washing them. They were wore out and weary. They'd not caught a thing. And these guys were professional fishermen. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, get back in the boat and throw your net on the other side. And Peter could have said, are you kidding me? Jesus, you're a carpenter. We're fishermen. What, what do you know about fishing? But you know, he obeyed. He said, and you know what obedience did? It brought him in a provision that he would have never seen outside the miracle working hand of God. There, there, there is something about obedience. Jesus even, when, Jesus, when God said, Jesus, give your life, and he was in the garden and he said, I don't want to do this. Like, this is going to be hard. Like, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, let it be. But then he declared, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. If there's no sacrifice, there's no salvation. If Jesus didn't give his life, we couldn't have life. It was all about obedience. When it comes to Elijah, again, I've said this multiple times. He's about to square off with 850 prophets of Baal. He'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil and beat the cheese out of him. But he don't have to depend on the Lord to, fend the, to send the fire. He's going to have to be completely obedient to the voice of God. If there's no 1 Kings 17, the preparation period, there's no 1 Kings 18, the declaration period. Where, where Elijah stood before the people and declared and, and demonstrated that there is no God like Jehovah God. So here, let me wrap it up. Here's what I think God's trying to teach us, instruct us, help us. I want you to learn total dependence. So I want you to ask yourself this question. What am I dependent on tonight? Am I dependent on my spouse to fulfill me? Am I, to, am I dependent on my kids to bring me a sense of purpose? Am I, am I dependent on my employee? Am I depend, what am I dependent on to not only provide for me, but to protect me and, and, to, and to work in me and work through me? And, and am, I, am I living in obedience? Am I, am I obeying the Lord completely? Am I obeying the Lord even when it doesn't make sense? Am I obeying the Lord even if it's painful? Am I obeying God to completion? Obedience matters. I think one of the reasons God used, and I love the Bible because it's so raw, isn't it? I mean, everybody had failed faults. Everybody had failures. Everybody was jacked up. But, but I'll tell you, they were, they, were, they were learning and growing independence and obedience. And may we be people that are dependent on the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, that are dependent on God and His Son, Jesus, and are obedient to His Word and follow after His heart. Amen, everybody. Why don't you stand with me, will you? And I just want you, before we go into worship, will you just ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me?